That is very good. The swing works the Oracle again. And the Oracle bowled in. That is out. Great theatre, magnificent drama. First match of the season, eh, huh? First match of the season, Martin. King Willow's on his throne and all's right with the world. Gods and flannelled fools. Um, <laughs> it's from a poem about cricket. Oh, very apt. How does it go on, my old hound? That's the only line I know. <laughs> oh, well, never mind. You certainly made the point. Hello. Welcome to Gods and Flannelled Fools, Episode 9, Worrell's West Indies. This is the series in which I walk through a history of English Test Match cricket, focusing on key series, matches, players and teams of a, a particular interest. Um, basically, I explore the myths and legends of the game that um, I suppose collectively have led to how we view Test Match cricket today. Now, if you haven't already listened, my pilot episode which is a, a brief history of the game up to the very first two test matches in 1877. Uh, that's available, as well as the first eight proper episodes in which I cover, uh, well, a variety of series, uh, themes and individuals ranging from um, Sidney Barnes, the great bowler, Jack Hobbs, Wally Hammond, a two uh, preeminent uh, uh, batsman of the era, uh, through to Bodyline um, with Larwood and Bradman and, and Timeless Tess. So worth checking all of those out on my channel. And I've got to say, um, I've really enjoyed doing these. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of uh, a work involved in, in uh, setting these up, preparing them. Um, but it's great to make it through to this stage, having covered um, both the, the early history of the game as well as the, the first... Uh, well, the first 80 years or so of the Test Match game in uh, in such detail. And, um, you know, I've really been able to shine a light on some of the, the star names in the context of the, the era and the circumstances that they played. So it's, uh, it's well worth the effort. Um, if you do have any comments, questions or suggestions, please do get in touch. There's a, a Twitter profile for the series, at GFFpod. Uh, and I'll also make some notes in support of this on the blog, which is available at... Uh, Gods and flannelled fools dot blogspot dot com. Now, in episode eight, I described a resurgence in the fortunes of the English cricket team uh, throughout the nineteen fifties, um, which was a decade in which they were uh, they were dominant in in many of the Ashes series, and their side contained a number of of household names that. Uh, would eventually go down as uh, legends of the game. In fact, you know, now when we look back, they're, they're revered in that fashion. Um, as ever with these things, the tables always turn. Um, success doesn't last forever. And as it transpired, the 60s would not be anywhere near as successful a decade for England uh, as the 50s, especially in Ashes series. Um, the likes of Dennis Compton and Len Hutton had retired by the, the middle of the, the 1950s and, and um, batsmen such as Peter May, who did make it into the 60s, uh, did so at, uh, at the end of their careers when they weren't quite as effective. Um, we still had Truman and Statham going strong along with some uh, resilient batting from the likes of uh, Ken Barrington and Colin Cowdery. Um, but despite the 5 0 thrashing of India in 1959, um, Australia held the Ashes under Richie Benno uh, in the next series, and Peter May resigned as captain following the Ashes defeat in, in 1961, and uh, he was succeeded by Ted Dexter. Um, now, the change in captaincy didn't really do much to improve results in the, in the early part of the 60s because Although they beat Pakistan, who had become the uh, the latest side to attain test status in 1952, um, they lost to India in the series that followed and then only managed to tie the Ashes series of 1962 to three, uh, which meant that Australia held on to the urn um, with a home series against the West Indies approaching. 
Uh, perhaps at, at this point, before we um, uh, talk any more about the development of the side, it would be worth just pausing on England's fortunes and turn our attention to the West Indies and the journey they'd taken as a test-playing entity. As I mentioned in one of the earlier episodes, the West Indies had been granted test-playing status in 1928 as a, uh, a side representing the British colonies, as a hybrid of, uh, well, the West Indies Federation plus British Guyana, as was. Um, now, aside from the usual amount of time it took for a, a new side to gain comfort in their ability at this level, which is something that's affected all uh, new international teams to uh, to the test arena and does so to this day, um, there were essentially two challenges for the West Indies that perhaps didn't quite exist to that level of prominence with other international sides. The first was... Uh, a geographical challenge in so much that they were a collection of islands, each with their own identity. And that created an extra level of complexity insofar as administration was concerned, um, not to mention the challenge of bringing these players together in, you know, in one team. The second challenge was their identity itself, which in the early days lay in the fact that most of their sides were made up of a mix of skin colours. Um, and they were always, almost always, captained by a white man. Um, now, this in itself was invariably due to, well, let's say social situations rather than anything to do with discrimination. But it did create something of an issue when it came to establishing the side as being a team who really represented the black identity of the islands as opposed to just an assortment of individuals from a series of uh, colonised islands, which um, from a historical perspective it, it could be seen as. Now, of course, all sides to an extent had identity issues to overcome from the outset of their, their test match history. Um, England, not least, because of the conflict between um, the concept of gentlemen and players and the influence of the MCC over the progression of the game. But it was clearly much tougher for a side such as the West Indies who had multiple practical challenges if they were to compete at the top level of the game. Um, Despite all this, though, in their short test playing history, they had managed to produce a number of star performers, not least the much celebrated batsman George Hedley. Uh, George, Hedley. Um, George Hedley was a, um, a, a talented Jamaican batsman. He made his debut in 1930. And although he would only play 22 tests in a career that was incredibly interrupted um, uh, well, severely interrupted by the war, he uh, he amassed 10 centuries in, in those 22 tests, at an average of over 60. And, um, uh, well, he was referred to as the Black Bradman by many of his contemporaries. Um, and his his principal legacy was to be the, the first genuinely world-class batsman to come from the islands who happened to be black. And that helped to forge the idea that the team could develop in, in this manner. It, it took the West Indies until 1935 to register their first series victory, which was a home win over England. Um, and as with other sides, their, their progress, as I say, was halted by the war, with a hiatus between uh, 1939 and 1948. Um, and in 1948, the MCC toured the islands and were defeated 2-0. Um, they then toured England in 1950. Um, and this uh, saw the emergence of their highly celebrated uh, spin duo of uh, Sonny Ramadin and Alf Valentine, uh, who led them to a, a 3-1 series victory. Um, so, so good success over England in that period. Um, Everton Weeks and Frank Worrell also emerged in, in this, uh, this particular period as, as uh, uh, leading batsmen. Um, and they, they then experienced mixed fortune throughout the, the 60s, uh, sorry, throughout the 50s, um, with England as the, the dominant test playing side in terms of success. 
But the West Indies had at least established themselves as a a highly competitive test playing nation, uh, capable of uh, capable of producing world class players with the bat and with ball, um, and importantly with a core of homegrown talented black players. And following on from the famous George Headley, emerged the figure of uh, Garfield Sobers, the now legendary Garfield Sobers. First innings, um, O'Neill made 180 yard. There was an absolutely superb innings by Sobers. I forget what he made, 100 and... 132. Did he? 132, mm-hmm. yes. And I, I can still, there were two shots in that innings by Sobers that I, I've, I've, I can remember now. He, he hit something through mid-wicket, um, a pull shot. But the trajectory of that shot, I can still see. I was having the time. It never rose, in my, in my view, more than about uh, five feet off the ground. And I thought it must have been like that at um, Trafalgar, you know, and Nelson ships of a cannonball carried away the rigging or something. It was extraordinary. It just went straight over the fence like a, like a rocket. <laughs> and it mowed down the crowd. <laughs> And then he hit something that hit uh, Colin McDonald at very deep mid-off on the shoulder, which, which uh, he off an off-drive, off Benno, I think. Um, and it hit McDonald on the left shoulder as he put a knee down to, to field it. And it hit the sideboard um, off, his off his shoulder. It was, uh, anyway, it was sobers. But anyway, and, and it all came down to this. The commentator Michael Charlton there talking about uh, Gary Sobers. Now, Gary Sobers was a Barbadian all-rounder. Uh, he was a powerful left-handed batsman, uh, curiously born with uh, an extra finger on each hand. Um, but as well as batting, he could also bowl left arm fast medium or left arm spin with equal effectiveness. In fact, there uh, probably hasn't been an all-rounder with so many different variations to uh, to his game. Uh, Sobers made his test debut for the West Indies in 1954 at the age of only 17 and he would eventually go on to score over 8,000 runs with 26 hundreds at an average of 57 um, taking 235 wickets in the process Uh, and that was part of an international career that lasted through well right through until 1974 His early career was mixed, to say the least. And in the first four years, uh, he was dropped by the West Indies on several occasions uh, with a top score of only 66. But in 1958, things changed and he registered his maiden test century against Pakistan and followed that up by smashing 364 not out, uh, overtaking Len Hutton's pre-war record in the process. And that was in itself something that would then stand until the 1990s when Brian Lara broke it for the first time. Um, and, and really, at this point in his career, his place in the, in the, te- in the West Indies test team was set. Um, his batting uh, continued to dominate bowling attacks across the world. And his bowling and versatility allowed Frank Worrell to concentrate purely on batting. Uh, When you look at at his bowling, I mean, Sobers would finish his career with 235 wickets at an average of 34, which, I mean, demonstrates that he could have been picked purely as a bowler in his own right uh, and very often came in at, uh, at first change. Uh, As much as anything else, though, uh, he's remembered as being the very first man to hit six sixes in an over whilst playing in a county championship match for Nottinghamshire against Glamorgan in Swansea. And that she's got to pick up. That was the right distance. He's hit that out of the ground. That's another one. Goodness gracious me, that peppered the top. You see the chap climbing up there to have a look over the wall. 52 in 29 minutes. That's another one up in the enclosure. Three balls, three sixes, 58. What an incredible bit of hitting. Oh, he's got that shorter one. It's up again. There it is, bouncing on the, bouncing on the concrete. Four sixes in four balls. 
This makes him 64. Four sixes. Wonder where Nash is going to bowl this one. And that will just carry. Now he's going to be out. Caught out. Oh, he drops it. He's over the boundary. Six it is. Five on the trot. Oh, this is incredible. Now, this is, this is, this is six on the trot's a world record. It's been done before, but uh, 70 on the board. And he's done it! He's done it! And my goodness, it's gone way down to Swansea. Six on the trot. 36 and one over. As I mentioned, uh, there had been a racial element to the selection of the West Indies side from the outset, and uh, there had always been calls for a black captain. And this finally materialised in 1960 when Frank Worrell was chosen to lead the West Indies on a tour to Australia. Uh, this was a, a tour that went down um, a, as being one of the great series and included the very first tied test. Um, and it was from that tied test that you heard a clip from earlier um, uh, concerning the 100 that uh, Sobers made during that game. Uh, and this, uh, this series led to the creation of the Frank Worrell um, trophy for future series between the two sides. Um, the West Indies were genuinely on the way up as a team, and they would beat most sides they came up with, uh, they came up against rather uh, in this period. And as such, they were a highly anticipated prospect when they arrived in England for a five-match Test series in 1963. As well as some of the great batsmen, as uh, Sobers, Worrell and uh, Rowan Kanhai, uh, there was uh, also uh, two very intimidating fast bowlers in this touring side by the name of Wes Hall and Charlie Griffiths, two men uh, who were perhaps the very first uh, in a history of the Caribbean to register what would uh, eventually become a long list of fast bowlers over the next few decades. Now, here's a clip of the former umpire and uh, Yorkshire and Leicestershire cricketer Dickie Bird talking about going out to face this particular pace attack uh, in a tour match playing for Leicestershire during that summer. Well, I've got to go out there and do my best. I padded up. And I went out with Maurice Harland to open the innings for Leicestershire. Now, in those days, ladies and gentlemen, we didn't wear helmets. And we didn't have these big chest protectors and these big thigh pads. We had nothing like that. My thigh pad was my handkerchief. <laughs> I thought, well, I've got to face him. So I went out that Saturday morning and I got ready to face the first ball from Wes Hall. And I remember I took leg stump guard from the umpire, and it's a good job I did. Because if I'd have took off in the middle, I don't think I'd have been here tonight. <laughs> I saw Wes Hall marking his run up out at the pavilion end, and I thought, where's he going? I thought he might be going to move the side screen. <laughs> but he wasn't. He was marking his run-up out at the side of the side screen. I thought, oh, no. <laughs> and I looked in front of me, and I couldn't see any fielders. <laughs> I thought, that's funny. I thought, where's his fielders? And I looked over my right shoulder, and 30 yard back, he got nine slips. Oh. I said, are you playing with us? I thought, well, I'll show him. I saw Wesley all racing, and he had this big gold medallion that was swinging in the breeze as he came in. And I didn't say anything else. I saw nothing. 
I think I pushed forward. I don't know. I may have played back. I can't remember. But I saw nothing. But I looked up and I saw all the West Indies players running round him and hugging him. Well bowled, Wes. Well bowled. I thought, well bowled. That's funny. <laughs> and I looked down and there were no off middle stumps there. I thought, where they go? <laughs> and I looked over my right shoulder and I could see him many a mile past the wicket keeper. And I often think if I'd have took off a middle, I don't think I'd have been here tonight. <laughs> Leading England in 1963 was, as I mentioned, Ted Dexter, uh, an aggressive middle order batsman uh, who had captained Sussex to success and had taken over from Peter May as England captain. Uh, he had experienced, uh, let's say, mixed initial success um, and crucially failing to recapture the ashes from Australia. Uh, that was really regarded as the bellwether of success, particularly in those days. Um, and Australia themselves had experienced uh, a resurgency under Richie Benno's leadership. Um, and this placed... Uh, Ted Dexter under a degree of pressure. The England side, as I have mentioned uh, earlier at this time, was something of a mixed bag. Um, it, it featured a combination of uh, genuinely talented stalwarts of the English game, um, but also some unestablished players. Um, and and in some areas there there were there were big weaknesses. Um, so I'll, I'll mention three names in the batting to illustrate the point. There was Mickey Stewart, who only played a handful of tests in the early 60s, um, although, of course, he gained fame later on by becoming a sec successful coach. Uh, and indeed, his son, Alec, would uh, represent England as a batsman, uh, wicketkeeper and captain throughout the 90s. Um, then there was Brian Close, uh, a real hard man from Yorkshire who actually made his debut for England in 1949, aged only 18, uh, and came back to play at various intervals um, uh, for England, most famously, of course, in, in 19, uh, 1976. Um, and then 30, there was Ken Barrington, who was the, the epitome of the solid and dependable uh, batsman, perhaps a you might say, a precursor to the likes of Raoul Dravid and Jonathan Trott in recent years at number three. Um, and he played for England between 1955 and 1968, uh, scoring 20 hundreds at a very impressive average of 58, uh, one of the, the best post-war records of any English batsman. Uh, he was another, actually, who had a, a later coaching career, which ended... Uh, tragically, when he suffered a fatal heart attack on a tour of the West Indies in 1980. The bowling uh, was led by the Roses attack of Truman and Statham, who were both in their pomp at this time, as I mentioned in the last episode. However, it, it was really felt that England's bowling was somewhat one-dimensional during this, this period, with little variation, really, outside the seamers. Um, and it was probably this lack of balance and depth that would ultimately plight the side throughout the decade with perhaps too much pressure on a small number of players and, and not enough variety and consistency uh, to be able to perform for, you know, an entire series against the best sides in the world. And uh, like, you know, if, you, if you're like me and you, uh, you know, you, you can remember that period of um, the late 80s, but particularly the, the 90s for England, um, you know, this, this rings quite true. This was a, a situation that the side found itself in uh, back in, in the 60s. And, and particularly, you know, when we've been uh, touring uh, parts of the world that, that require certain skill sets um, uh, or variety in bowling attacks, and we haven't had it. And so on uh, to the first test of, of that summer in 1963, which took place at Old Trafford, where the West Indies uh, sealed a comprehensive 10-wicket victory. Um, Conrad Hunt scored 182 in their huge 501 for six declared uh, in the first innings, and Lance Gibbs took uh, two fifers, and the game was completed within four days. 
Uh, the second test was at Lords, starting on the 20th of June 1963, and it remains a classic to this day. The West Indies were restricted to 301 in their first innings, thanks largely to Fred Truman's uh, six wickets. And uh, England almost gained parity with 297 in response, and Charlie Griffiths uh, took uh, a five for in, in that innings. Batting conditions were not ideal, and in the second innings, Truman once again chipped away, taking another five for as West Indies were bowled out for 229, setting England uh, a target of 234 for a series levelling victory. Now, their chances were not helped by two unfortunate factors. Firstly, uh, the rain that caused day four to end prematurely, uh, and then subsequently delayed the start of play on the final day until after, uh, after lunch. And this, this lost time would ultimately be crucial. Uh, the second factor was that at uh, 72 for three, Colin Cowdery fended off a uh, particularly vicious Wes Hall bouncer from his face and broke his wrist in the process and had to retire hurt. Uh, of course, in this era, as we heard before in the Dickie Bird clip, uh, protection wasn't much better than it had been right at the start of the Test match era, save for probably slightly more depth on the padding, uh, uh, you know, pads and gloves. But there certainly wasn't thigh pads or chest guards, let alone helmets. Um, and then Ken Barrington and Brian Close put up a resilient partnership, uh, despite a barrage of, of short pitch deliveries, taking England to the, to the brink of, of the runs required. But more wickets fell, and when Derek Shackleton was run out in, in the final over of the day, they were 228 for nine, still needing five runs to tie and six to win. Colin Cowdery then reappeared from the pavilion, his arm in plaster, determined not to allow his injury to cause his side to lose the game. Fortunately, he was at the non-striker's end and David Allen played out the final two deliveries for the draw, though it was uh, certainly a case of, of what might have been. Uh, interestingly, there, there are clips online that um, you may have seen of Brian Close with severe bruising to his chest and side that many people think uh, are attributed to his famous innings at Old Trafford in 1976 against uh, uh, Roberts and Holding. But actually, these injuries were sustained during the second test at Lords at the hands of Wes Hall and Charlie Griffiths. He'll never get there. He's out. He's run out. Shackleton's run out, but Cowdery can still come in. Shackleton is run out, and of course, the run doesn't count, so it's still six runs to go, and two balls, and Cowdery, with one hand, is going to come in. Well, he didn't win the race there, Shackleton. David Allen was up to him very quickly. I don't think he realised. Five runs needed for a tie, six for a win. Kaji resumes, 19 not out. What tactics he can be suggesting, I just don't know. Everybody clambering round by the side. And Kaji's given the orders, which Ted Dex has obviously sent down. And we'll see, see what's going to happen. Two balls to go then, very dark.